evening, everyone. I am Inakshi Anchalia, and on behalf of the Governing Committee of CAHO, it is my proud privilege to welcome you all to the 10th Masterclass of the Masterclass Series 2. The topic for today is quality and patient safety, and the faculty is the quality queen, Dr. Lalu Joseph. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the session, Mr. Joseph Pasanga. Sir is the COO of Narayana Health City. He is also the North Zone representative of CAHO. We welcome you, sir, and over to you. Thank you, Meenakshi. It's a great privilege and honor to be introducing uh, today's masterclass anchor, Dr. Lalu Joseph, quality manager and accreditation coordinator of Christian Medical College, Bello, which is the largest hospital in the country to be accredited by the National Accreditation Board for Hospitals and Healthcare Providers, which is the NABH. Prior to joining healthcare, she was the vice president of a software company and was a teaching assistant at Portman School of Management, University of Toronto. A mechanical engineer by profession, she went on to complete her master's and doctorate in business administration and a diploma in CQI from the Canadian Healthcare Administration. A keen learner, she completed the one-year executive management program from none other institutions than the IAM Bangalore in 2016. She has many book chapters and publications to her credit and was part of developing the entry-level guidelines of NABH standards a joint initiative of NABH and the World Bank. She was involved in overseeing the implementation of QMS in selected government hospitals of Karnataka to the consortium of accredited healthcare organizations, which is CAHO, as part of a World Bank funded project and a part of the task force of Karnataka Knowledge Commission implementation of procedural costing. She developed the basic and advanced certified professionals of quality implementation in hospitals, that's the CPQIH programs for CAHO, which are well sought after, and also the seven day programs of CAHO. A passionate teacher and trainer, she's involved in training quality implementation across the country through NABH, CAHO, HPI, and also the faculty of so many hospital administration programs. She is the principal assessor of NABH and a trainer for NABH, she is the Secretary General of CAHO, the best outgoing student of VIT Business School in 20, uh, 2000. She has won many awards and is a proud recipient of the Young Quality Achiever Award of 2016 and the Dr. M.S. Ashraf Award, Indian Medical Association, Tamil Nadu State in 2018. Dr. Lalu Joseph, <clears throat> a warm welcome to be, the, to, to be the anchor of this masterclass. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Meenakshi, over to you. And just a small request to the, to the rest of to the participants that should you have any questions, put it in the Q&A box and it should be answered by Dr. Lalu and team. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph, sir, Meenakshi and the team uh, for that round of introduction. And thank you all, dear participants, for joining this program. Let me try and cover this huge chapter in about 45 minutes, followed by q and I'm sure you will have a lot of questions, which uh, let me see if I can answer to the best of my ability. I will straight away begin with my presentation. I will start with the screen share, quality and patient safety. So the focus is going to be on the PSQ chapter, which earlier was the CQI, the continuous quality improvement. That is rephrased as PSQ. PSQ stands for Patient Safety and Quality Improvement. So I will go through that chapter and also some of the requirements for quality and patient safety from other chapters that quality managers and patient safety officers will have to take cognizance of. So as I mentioned earlier, it's going to be a vast presentation. I'm sure you'll have a lot of doubts, so note them, put them down in the Q&A box. So what are the differences between the fourth edition and fifth edition? This is one chapter where the number of objective elements have been brought down. So in this particular fifth edition, you have 49 objective elements, whereas in the fourth edition, we had almost 59 objective elements. 
Now that doesn't mean this chapter has become smaller. It is a matter of merger of various objective elements. There's a lot of clarity that has come into the fifth edition. Ambiguity has been removed and there's nothing called as self-explanatory. You will notice that all the objective elements have explanatory notes. So there are still some areas, gray areas, which we'll try and address. I'm going to go through the chapter one by one with all the standards. PSQ1, the organization implements a structured patient safety program. I think the most important thing is the word structured and the patient safety program. Look at this. The first thing that we need to take, most important thing that we'll have to take notice of is the multidisciplinary safety committee. The patient safety program is developed, implemented and maintained by a multidisciplinary safety committee. So earlier this was given the second priority. Now this has come into the forefront, multidisciplinary safety committee. Now who should be the members of this committee? Administration, facility management, safety officers, patient safety officers and other safety officers. In any organization, we have actually many safety officers if you look at it infrastructure, radiation safety officers, and uh, hemovigilance program, there is an officer to take care of that. So all those officers, some clinician representatives, nurses, paramedical staff, and other representatives from clinical and support departments. So we, here we are talking about a very large committee, which is the multidisciplinary safety committee. So what are the responsibilities of this particular committee? They are responsible for coordinating development, implementation, monitoring the safety plans, protecting the patients from any harm. If you look at it from safety, it has now come to patient safety. So the focus is going to be on patients, protecting the patients from harm, from environment, lack of care or any safety measures. So it is a comprehensive program, not just the patient safety program of the WHO patient safety goals. It is starting from infrastructure, fire safety, the needle stick injuries, the occupational health issues, everything comes under the purview of this patient safety program. Now, this particular edition talks more and more about risk management, particularly performing proactive risk assessment in both clinical and non-clinical processes and areas. When we talk about proactive risk management, any new system that you develop, you have to try and assess the risk associated with that, put in control measures to mitigate the risk. Even after you do all that, you will still have a residual risk. You will have to have measures to address those residual risk. So there are various tools available, as we all know, hazard identification and risk analysis tools, FMEA, all those should be used for understanding and to make sure that we have a proactive risk assessment in both clinical and non-clinical processes. So over to the next one, which is the patient safety program is implemented, developed and maintained by a multidisciplinary committee, we know. So I'm sorry, I'm repeating that. So we need to have a manual. The entire thing has to be documented in a manual. So you need to have a separate manual, which is a safety manual. You could call it as a safety manual or a patient safety manual. Please understand this committee has to meet every month. Earlier we used to meet, you know, once in six months, once in three months, because it's a large committee. But here it is now prescriptive that this safety committee or your patient safety committee has to meet every month and review the development implementation and also the plans that you have put in place. So what you should probably do is to take many indicators and present them into this safety committee on a monthly basis. You can put turns and get them presented in this committee. Now here, what are the major elements related to patient safety that one must cover? All clinical services and support services. So now you will notice that this patient safety program should address both the clinical and the support services. So there were questions as to what happens to the general safety. Yes, it is addressed under this broad gamut of patient safety program. So the entire aspect of safety should be covered under this, both under the clinical services and support services put together. Now, the important thing here is you need to cover incidents ranging from no harm to sentinel event. You may ask me, why should I cover no harm? It is extremely important to look at these near misses and no harm. Many of the quality professionals who are attending this program must be aware of the Heinrich Pyramid. So for every 300 near misses, there are 30 minor accidents and one serious accident. So look at this ratio, 300 is to 30 is to one. 
so the more you capture these near misses you are actually trying to avoid some of these major incidents from happening so the most important thing for me as a quality professional is not capturing sentinel events but capturing near misses now here you need to define what is a near miss what about adverse events the minor incidents and what about sentinel events what constitutes harm what constitutes no harm why are we defining this we need to make sure that everything gets reported often you have doubts whether i should report this or not there is a small cautery burn in the theater should i report it there is no harm in reporting that's probably again a near miss so go ahead and report the maximum reports you have then it is the role of the quality and the safety professional to see them through and try and understand and put systems in place so that no adverse or sentinel events happen so this has to be documented so the entire group your staff know what to report how to report so please define it in the manual now coming to this question designated patient safety officer coordinates the implementation of the patient safety program now we are going to add on more and more people earlier it was only the quality manager then we started talking about the patient safety officer now we have patient safety officer and clinical safety officer all right so you look at this patient safety officer the standard says very clearly that that person should have sound knowledge of both patient safety and general safety now you may ask me a question should it be a clinician or should it be a nurse it can be anybody it can be a clinician it can be a nurse it can be a general admin person it can be an engineer but the person should have thorough knowledge of both patient safety related issues and general safety and please understand this person should be reporting to the top management when we say top management then the question arises should he directly report to the ceo now that depends on your organization you may have another line of command between your ceo and the quality that's okay perfectly fine as long as it's not diluted and you have a direct voice in the administration how you define how you make sure that these issues are addressed quality and patient safety is in your institutional prerogative but please note that it can be a person it can be a doctor can be a nurse can be another person but they should have some knowledge of patient and general safety you should also define the roles and responsibilities of these patient safety officers try and identify and develop champions in patient safety hospitals are huge areas with lots and lots of departments so each area you can have a nodal person who is looking at safety in my organization we call them the department safety advisors the dsas so each unit each department has a department safety advisor and they form a group called as the safety council under the safety officer you can develop your own way of reporting now comes the second aspect designated clinical safety officer this is what is important now there is a clear definition for clinical safety officer uh, and what and how this person should moderate this program designated clinical safety officer coordinates implementation of the clinical aspects of the patient safety program please note they are going to look into all the hardcore patient safety aspects whether it is the national patient safety goals or the international patient safety goals the clinical safety officer is the person who is going to work on it and they are going to part of be part of this overall safety committee or the safety group the clinical safety officer has to be a doctor or a nurse and they have to have current professional registration and experience in the application of risk management in clinical domains without understanding risk management a patient safety officer or a safety officer cannot function at all they have to look at proactive risk management the various hazards the likelihood of something happening what is the risk scoring how to develop a risk register how to put controls in place how to mitigate these risks and how to audit all these controls that you have put in place so it's very important that they have inherent and thorough knowledge of risk management the organization can choose a doctor or nurse who is held in high regard by peer irrespective of their seniority so it need not be the senior most person it can be anybody who is well reputed who has the bandwidth who has the multidisciplinary approach and he, who can handle people that is what is most important now coming to psq1f 
The patient safety program identifies opportunities for improvement based on the review at predefined intervals. Now there is a predefined frequency that is also put down, which is once in three months at least. Now you may ask me that the committee committee meets once in three, once in a month, but the frequency of review can be once in three months, which means your indicators can be reviewed once in three months. So that is perfectly fine. At regular predefined intervals, the review has to happen. What is the frequency? As defined in your safety manual, but at least once in three months. You can do more than that. Every month also you can do a review, but every month going through this entire thing may not make any sense at all. You may not be able to identify the trends. So you can do a set of three indicators in one meeting, another, another meeting. Why are we saying as frequency of review because if you don't put it down then it is just before the day of the assessment so therefore you define and you make sure it happens the review happens in the safety committee what are the other things that you can include in the review report of your facility inspection rounds patient safety incidents that you identify and report the risk management related aspects the new hazards you have identified risk scoring the mitigation and control measures and also analysis of the key safety indicators and you must maintain minutes that we know all of us as quality professionals, we know how to maintain minutes, how to follow up on these minutes and how to make sure that they are documented appropriately. Now coming to PSQ1G, the organization performs proactive run analysis of patient safety risk and makes improvement accordingly. So this again, now we are talking about risk. So this is a new objective element. So you have to use this as a tool and at a minimum, at least one patient safety related risk should be identified as an improvement project. So if you say, I'm going to improve the handover of doctors and nurses in my hospital, and I take that up as a quality improvement project, I understand what is happening. Currently, I put in measures, I do training improvements, I make sure that it is appropriately done, simplified, better for the staff to do, and make sure that the compliance improves and also monitor the number of incidents of handover related issues that happened during that year. So the intent of this analysis is to eliminate unsafe actions and conditions and that can cause potentially harmful accidents or incidents to the patients. So we are going to focus on at least one safety related risk, analyzing them, taking them up as a quality improvement project every year. You may use a lot of proactive analysis, risk analysis tools like the HERA, FMEA, simulation, fault tree analysis. If you want to know more about all these tools, we have a program that's happening, which is on risk management. I would urge you to register for this uh, certified professionals in healthcare risk management program. The patient safety program is reviewed and updated at least once a year. Now, this entire program has to be at least reviewed once a year, which means your entire manual, you go through that at least once a year to make sure that you are aligned to the current literature. There may be newer guidelines coming in. Are you updating them regularly? Based on the reviews of your facility and your other indicators, have you revised and reviewed your manual? You have to look at it. I would say it has to happen more periodically. As and when you understand, you go ahead and revise your manuals. And it's a good practice to make them available as online soft copies rather than having them as hard copies because then you don't know which unit is holding which version of the manual. So go ahead and review them more frequently, but at least once a year. If the annual review does not find any opportunities for improvement, it is the same as what it was before, then that should also be minuted in your uh, committee meeting, saying that there were no changes identified. That's very, very important. Otherwise, you know, the assessors or anybody may ask, you have not actually reviewed the manual, you have just copied and pasted. So if you did not find, please minute it that there were no revisions to the previous manual. The organization adapts and implements national, international patient safety goals. Now, this becomes the responsibility of the clinical safety officer to audit these, to make sure that staff are aware of whether it is the current national safe patient safety goals or the WHO patient safety goals. And these have been addressed in multiple areas in the NABH fifth edition standards. Now, there is something known as a core. We know of four categories of objective elements, core, commitment, achievement, and excellence. The core ones are the ones that are related to patient safety. So there are about 30 plus objective elements that are core objective elements 
that are very specific to patient safety related issues. So these are addressed in various areas in the uh, NABH 5th edition. So you have to make sure that you are following them, auditing them and the staff awareness is very good and the incidents, anything pertaining to these issues are reported meticulously and analyzed and quality improvement measures, safety measures are taken appropriately. Now we we'll move on to the second one, PSQ2. The organization implements a structured quality improvement and continuous monitoring program. Now the quality pro professionals have been pushed slightly aside. Safety professionals have come into the forefront. Now one may ask me, can the quality professional be the safety officer also of the institution? Yes. Nothing says that you cannot be. There is a designated patient safety officer. But that designated patient safety officer can also be the quality manager or the quality uh, professional in the organization. Nothing stops you from having that. But there's only one specification, which is a clinical safety officer who has to be a doctor nurse. Again, if it is the same person, no problem. The same person can be all the three as well, depending on the workload. The organization implements a structured quality improvement and continuous monitoring program. Let's look at this one by one. It is in, you know, it is just the same thing as safety, I would say. The same thing replicated for quality as well. So here, the quality improvement program is developed, implemented and maintained by a multidisciplinary committee. Now again, there a multidisciplinary committee, here again a multidisciplinary committee. In a structured manner, it has to integrate across the organization, Framework for risk management, ongoing management, monitoring and improvement based on all the audits and the reviews that you are performing. The roles and responsibilities of this committee has to be very clearly spelt out. But please understand that this is the mother of all committees. This is the apex committee. This You can call it as a quality steering committee, core committee, quality improvement committee, quality committee, how you want. But this is the core committee. It receives inputs and important deliberations from all other committees. It has to have representation from management, clinical and support department. Again, a multidisciplinary committee. I think most of us have this committee existing in our organization. The quality improvement program is comprehensive and covers all elements related to quality assurance. What are those? The quality goals, the objectives, framework for quality improvement activities, your KPIs, how are you going to collect the data, how are you going to analyze, how are you going to present, how are you going to understand the trends, important indicators as identified, what is the frequency of the mock drills, where are you going to do, when, how, your audit schedules of all your chart audits, regular audits, your focused audits, your committees, all the committees, the terms and reference of your committees, the frequency of meeting, your review policy, and also how you take your CAPA, corrective and preventive measures, how are you going to analyze them and what are the CAPA taken. So here the most important thing is you are once again going to have another manual, which is the quality improvement manual. So this is not the apex manual, which is not the quality manual. This manual has to cover all important aspects of your quality improvement program, which is all the other things that we talked about, you know, the audit schedule, committees, references, your indicators, the numerator, denominator, how are you going to present it? All this should be covered under this quality improvement manual. For example, even if you now the laboratory safety and laboratory quality program may be finding a place under the lab standards in CO, AAC. But this has to cover that as well. Laboratory, imaging, emergency, OT, ICU, all departments, clinical, non-clinical departments, their key performance indicators, the numerators, denominators, the audits, the clinical audits, everything should find a mention in your quality improvement program. So it's a very comprehensive program that we are talking about. The quality improvement program, the aim is to improve process efficiency and effectiveness. There we were talking about safety. Here it is about process efficiency and effectiveness. What are the various things that we need to look at? What are the impact of managerial processes and innovations that you have undertaken at the departmental level and at the organization level? So we are moving slightly away into process efficiency, looking at systems, processes and the outcomes. So earlier it was all mixed up together. Now there's a clarity as to what this quality team should be clearly looking into. But impact of the clinical processes, improvement in patient safety, improvement in the care delivery, reduction of costs, introduction of environmentally friendly measures. So we are typically talking about all those areas that we want to improve by measuring and making sure that proper appropriate measures are put in place. 
So here, what you need to note is the quality improvement program aims at promoting the use of quality tools. So often this is kept at the back end. We need to now try and apply quality tools like all your Pareto analysis, fishbone analysis, managerial tools like PDCA cycles and all the risk management tools and new strategies to improve both clinical and managerial processes. So it's a huge role that the quality managers will have to undertake. There's a designated individual for coordinating and implementing the quality improvement program. We call them the quality manager, quality coordinator, quality assistant, whatever you want to call it. This designated individual, what are the capabilities? They should know the accreditation standards. They should know about the statutory requirements, which is extremely important. Hospital quality improvement principles, how to evaluate, how to manage data, how to present data, how to apply tools and also the entire functioning of the hospital and its operations. So you're looking at a superman or a superwoman to be holding the position of a quality manager. As always, this role is a very, very critical role in the accreditation exercise. They, their roles and their responsibilities will have to be designed. And like the way we talked about safety champions, we have to identify and develop quality champions in quality improvement. In my organization, we call them the department quality managers. And we have one department quality manager, every clinical unit who basically act as a liaison. They are middle level faculty. They are not directly employed by us. They are part of the department. If it's a surgical DQM, he's part of the department and he's a surgeon himself. But any audits that we do, any presentations that we make is all done through them. And individual specific trainings are also conducted by them. They are part of our quality improvement initiative. And the, the program is to support champions in quality improvement to drive the improvement. So you need to have the departmental leaders and the departmental team motivated and involved. Otherwise, it is not a police force that is going to be managing this quality improvement exercise. And also, like the way we talked about the safety, here they have to report directly to the top management. That's very clear. The quality improvement program identifies opportunities for improvements based on review at predefined intervals. Again, once in three months. You look at it, the quality indicators will have to be presented. All these reviews will have to be done at least once in three months. And please understand, the quality improvement program has to be a dynamic process. And it is not something that you just do and finish off and go away. It's a dynamic process and it outlines periodic review at different levels each department level, unit level, and please understand this has to find a place in your top management reviews as well. And the minutes of the meeting will have to be maintained, all that we are completely aware of. The quality improvement program is reviewed and updated at least once a year. Same like the safety manual here again, it has to be reviewed and updated once a year. Newer literature, newer areas of improvement, your quality improvement programs that you have identified, your audits, feedback and other things can add input to the way that you revise your protocols and SOPs. If the review doesn't happen, you're not changing anything and you have not identified any opportunity for improvement, you have to minute that in your meeting, stating that the, um, you know, should be documented in the minutes of the quality improvement committee meeting that you have not changed anything. Perfect. Now, audits are conducted at regular intervals as a means of continuous improvement. Lot of stress on internal audit, hospital-wide internal audit. We used to do that at one point it was once in four months and then it became once in six months. Here it says at least once in six months as per schedule. You have to draw out the schedule and make sure it happens. It has to be done by identified staff. In my case, we do it through our department quality managers and department safety advisors and we train them every year on the NABH standards and the other standards and guidelines. And they have to assess all areas independent of their work. They don't, surgeon doesn't get into surgical area and audit. He can go into maybe the medical ICU and audit. Conduct a formal meeting. All applicable standards and objective elements will have to be uh, reviewed. Corrective actions and preventive actions will have to be taken by the departments and document. This has to happen almost like a NABH assessment or any other assessment. Implementation of changes will have to be verified and recorded. They may send you a closure report, but you also have to verify and make sure that the implementation of changes happen. How do you do it? You do it by another audit probably. And you need to also define the choice and frequency of audits for priority areas and areas of concern based on the trends in indicators and identified risks, which means the high risk areas, high priority areas, this kind of audit has to happen more frequently. How do you identify that? Based on your incidences and based on other quality and safety indicators and the trend that it shows. I hope that is clear. 
there's an established process to monitor and improve the quality of the nursing care a very very important objective element very specific to monitoring the quality of the nursing care how do you do that first and foremost identify key performance indicators now there are many performance indicators tracked by our nurses falls pressure sores pressure sores developed within the organization developed from outside worsening now there are uh, accidental delining and uh, you may talk about extra vacations identify as many indicators as possible for the nursing area try and monitor monitor them very very closely and these will have to improve the quality of the nursing care and the most important thing is you have to do the audits in the form of competency evaluation that means the nurses are the ones who do a lot of small procedures and they need to be assessed whether they are able to actually do these procedures properly so we call in you know when we do the assessment we do something known as dops which is the directly observed procedures which means when somebody is starting a line we stand there and see whether they are doing the right way they are starting the line in the right manner so there are different aspects that you can audit witness demonstration of key nursing procedures such as medication administration iv cannulation or you could give them a questionnaire and ask them to fill in like checking their awareness you can have a interview schedule and ask them whether they are aware of the important components cpr you can ask them to demonstrate and try and see whether they are aware of it or they do, are doing it the right way so now you have to uh, you have to make sure that this entire thing is addressed in a more comprehensive manner now coming to the third one which is the most important the backbone of this entire quality improvement program the organization identifies and monitors key indicators to oversee the clinical structures processes and outcomes this used to be a very elaborate chapter now that has been put together and it is uh, you know there are about 32 indicators that are given but that you need to follow you need to make sure that you are adopting to those indicators you are monitoring them however you will need to have more and more indicators very specific to your organization so it has it is slightly moved away from a prescriptive mode to a more comprehensive aspect of care in your own organization otherwise what we notice you go to an hospital hospital they will be monitoring indicators like blood transfusion rate and all that which is totally irrelevant for them so now here you focus on your scope of service your own clinical department also follow some of the other indicators prescribed by nabh so we know these indicators which is patient assessment safety and quality control diagnostic related which includes labs and radiology medication management use of blood and blood products surgical indicators mortality and morbidity indicators for want of time i'm just going to uh, go through some of the indicators where there is clarity that is required patient assessment i think we are more or less clear about it safety and quality control programs the major thing that has come in is that those reports that are reaching the patients with mistakes are the ones that you are actually going to be capturing as reporting errors previously it was said that even prior to dispatch but here it says you you it is a good practice to capture those as well but what is typically put down is those errors that are reaching the patients or those are released now when it comes to adherence to safety precautions it clearly spells out that it should be done from by a independent person not the same person working in the lab auditing the safety precautions in their own areas it has to be done by an independent person maybe you can do a uh, swap of microbiology doing radiology or radiology or radiology doing a nuclear medicine you can swap and get them to do the safety precautions audit there is a lot of clarity that is required in medication errors rate now the formula specifies as denominator total number of opportunities of medication errors that is extremely difficult to capture and there is no clarity on that the previous formula was very clear on that i feel you know the number of inpatient days now if you look at this the total number of medication errors that you need to capture are all incident driven whereas the denominator it's little difficult to capture because each prescription may have uh, 10 drugs prescribed and those 10 drugs prescribed may have frequency related dose related uh, or transcription related and n number of errors and how to calculate this entire thing is a point that we need to clarify with nabh now coming to use of blood and blood products 
transfusion medicine has to now start capturing more and more indicators like DTI or uh, donor reactions. All those can also be incorporated. But these are the two indicators that are prescribed. Surgical services, again, unplanned return to OT and rescheduling of surgeries. I want to bring in one clarity here, which often many people ask, what is this unplanned return to OT? And what is this re-exploration? By definition, re-exploration is any procedure for the index procedure where you are repeating the surgery again within a period of 30 days. Then what is this unplanned return to OT? Again, the index procedure for which you are taking the person into the theater during the same admission. So if you look at it, the re-exploration is a larger set. Unplanned return to OT is a subset of that. So within the same admission, you do a procedure and you relate, you realize the next day that there is fluid collection or a hematoma and you move the patient back into theater, open the wound again, open the, um, you know, the surgical site again, release the pressure or drain the wound and close. Then it is an unplanned return to OT. Is it also a re-exploration? It is. But once the patient is discharged, after 30, after 20 days, he has a surgical site infection and he's coming in with dehiscence and you are doing a deprivement or you're taking the patient back into theater for re-exploring, then it is again re-exploration. So re-exploration is a larger set and unplanned return to OT is within the same admission. I hope I have made it clear. Now coming to standardized mortality ratio in ICU, this is a new indicator that we need to track and I'll explain that slightly to you. Now, when it comes to these indicators, it is important not just to capture the numbers. You have to go as quality professionals in depth into the data and try and understand if it's a surgical wound. Is it clean, clean, contaminated, contaminated, dirty? And is it a superficial one? Is it a deep incisional one or is it organ related? Even use classifications like Clavian Dindo and try and understand this in a more uh, better manner rather than just saying, you know, I have five surgical re-exploration, I have three surgical site infections. So it is better to go in detail into these indicators and try and understand and analyze them better. Standardized mortality ratio for ICU. How do you calculate this? So what is this formula? It is the actual death in ICU divided by the predicted death in ICU into 100. How do you calculate this predicted death in ICU? There are various tools available. The Apache scoring, SOFA, SAPS, PRISM, etc. What I have done here is I've just taken the example of the Apache scoring. There are a lot of calculators available. This Apache scoring, the system, has many, many parameters that you put in. For example, the temperature. The temperature is about 40 or 38.4 here. It's zero points. If it is 40, it will say the scoring is three. So that way, for each of these parameters, there is a scoring. Also, if it is a non-surgical patient, there is a scoring, surgical patient. And again, there is a clear, there is a clear cut scoring pattern which is given. Zero to four, if the point is zero to four, it is four percentage uh, if it's a non-operative patient and it's one percentage risk if it's a post-op patient, which means four out of 100 patients have a mortality. I hope you understood. So this is the predicted mortality. Now, coming to a simple example, I, I couldn't make it uh, simplified than this. Let's assume in an ICU there are 100 non-operated patients, which is they are not, they are all medical patients. 50 or 0 to 4 Apache score and 50 or 20 to 24 points, okay? Now, when there are 50 patients with 0 to 4 points, the expected mortality is about 4 percentage, which means out of 100 patients, 2 patients, uh, or rather out of 100 patients, 4 patients will die. Here, in your 50 population, two patients can die. The expected death is two patients. Now, when it is 20 to 24 points, the expected mortality is about 40 percentage. So, here, out of your 50 patients, 20 patients can die. So, totally, the expected mortality or the predicted mortality in your ICU for that month is this 22 patients. That is your predicted mortality. Now, actual situation, let's assume that you have lost 20 patients of the 100 patients admitted. In this case, your SMR is less than 1, which is lower than expected, which means you are functioning well. Your standardized mortality ratio is good. Now, coming to situation 2, the actual death in ICU is about 25 patients out of the 100, which is your SMR is greater than expected. Something has, I mean, it's something that you need to look into. Situation 3, actual deaths in ICU is 22 patients of the 100. You are expected, you are predicted, and your actual is the same. So, which means your SMR equal to 1, which is as expected. 
I can't explain this simpler than this because I'm not a clinical person. I have tried to understand this with a lot of difficulty, but I feel it is extremely easy doing this. But the scoring on Apache, there are a lot of uh, templates and scores available online. So you have to now make sure that your uh, uh, mortality audits in ICUs are conducted using this Apache score, predicting the death and the actual death and trying to understand the SMR. Now, the organization identifies and monitors the key indicators to oversee infection control activities. This, I'm sure, would have been explained in detail by Dr. Sanjeev Singh in the last session. What are you going to capture? CAR-T, CLAP, CSSI, VAE. So, we are moving away from VAP to VAE. VAE is a broader set. VAP is a subset of VAE. VAE uh, consists of VAC, IVAC, VAP. So, we were earlier capturing only the VAP. Now, we have to capture VAE. So, the entire thing, as per... CDC guidelines you have to adopt or any other guideline adopted or if it's an ABH which is mandating, there's a numerator and denominator for everything that is mandated by an ABH here, you have to follow that. What are the other indicators? Hand hygiene compliance rate, your SSIs, your percentage of cases which received appropriate prophylaxis within specific time. What is the specific time? Within 60 minutes. Incidence of needle stick injuries, all this will come under that. The organization identifies and monitors key performance indicators to oversee managerial process. What are those? Your medication procurement, your utilization rates, patient and staff satisfaction, waiting time for consultation, diagnostics, available or, uh, availability and content of medical record. This again is the same as the fourth edition. These are the ones that are prescribed, but you can develop as many indicators as possible because the more the number of indicators you have, the better your management is going to be. So make sure that you develop indicators as prescriptive as possible for your departments. Try and monitor them very, very well. Now, in our pharmacy, we have decided the refund of drugs, uh, cut strips, all that as indicators and even some expired drugs, all those are put as indicators now for us. The organization identifies and monitors key indicators to oversee patient safety related activities, which are basically on the two categories. One is the patient safety goals and the other one is the risk management. What is prescribed is patient safety goals, your bed sores, patient falls, uh, usage of your surgical safety checklist and all your adverse and near misses and other incidents that have happened. Risk management, your variations in mock drill, near misses, number of calls, fire calls, and other issues. Human resources, of course, your nurse patient ratio for ICU and wards. These are put down, but you can develop as many indicators in all these areas as possible to try and develop this program well. Please understand, the more indicators you are monitoring, the better you perform. So please make sure that you have more and more indicators very specific to the area that you are focusing on. Now, how do you do the sample size? You may say I have a population of about 9,000 outpatients in a month. So what is your sample size when you're collecting your feedback, when you're auditing your outpatient charts, there is a chart that is given. This is based on a formula. Now you may ask me, what about my sample size? I am a large institution and my screening population is about 1 lakh outpatients in a month. Beyond this 20,000, it is 10 percentage because the larger the sample, uh, your population, the lesser the sample size. So beyond 20,000 screening population, you can adopt a, uh, you know, ballpark figure of about 10 percentage. Now, when you are doing the sampling, please adopt to stratified random sampling and not just convenient sampling because you will not get a clear picture. When you stratify the sample and collect after stratification random samples, then you cover the entire population. Now, when you are doing an audit on chart or documentation, make sure your cardiology is covered, nephrology, neurology, thoracic, everybody is covered in a stratified manner. And within that group, you can then randomize in a simple uh, random manner. Now, organization is a mechanism to capture patient reported outcome measures. Now, this is a new objective element that has come in. Now, this is used to be a research tool. Now, this has become a very effective tool in the West to be relating to the patients and trying to understand the post uh, hospital care and what your patients are, how are they, what is the outcome, is it as per what you have told them. The simplest example one can take is the total knee replacement. You may have told your patients that you will become ambulant in about 15 days. You will have no pain after 30 days. But typically, it is based on some literature or some studies that have been conducted in the West or your own studies, your own experience. But in reality, is it adjusted? Is it age adjusted or sex adjusted? Or 
uh, including your kind of population, the socioeconomic status. So you need to try and understand your clientele. So after they get discharged, you try and ask them with a pro forma, try and understand their health status. You can do it in the form of a telephonic interview. Try and understand their outcome. What is their pain level after one week, after two weeks, three weeks, four weeks? What is the level of mobility? How ambulant are they? Uh, are they having any uh, other aspects? Are they having difficulty, um, you know, using the toilet? Things like that. If you can understand what about their psychological aspects? What about their physical health, mental health, social health? So we are now trying to understand the entire gamut of wellness rather than just looking at the outcome, whether they are able to walk. So this is after a patient gets, you can start from the time that the patient is in your hospital. You can start this entire thing and go beyond. We, I, in order to make it simplified, I should say, it is the clinical experience or the procedure-based experience that the patient wants to actually feed back to you. And you need to understand so that you are in a realistic mode to tell your other patients, yes, you can expect to walk probably in two months time. So it's a relationship that you build with your patient by using this particular tool. There are many uh, webinars that we have conducted. It's available in the uh, CAHO website. Please go ahead and uh, look into them. PROM by E.L. Zimlikman and PROM by Dr. Sanjeev Singh. There are two beautiful lectures available. Verification. Now, this is an important task that the quality team has to embark on. Verification of data. You may have 100 people collecting the data for you. Your lab team, your radiology team, your nurses in the theaters, ICU. All of them are collecting data for feeding into your key performance indicators. How do you verify that they are collecting the right data? They may think that they are collecting the right data. In reality, is it the right data? We adopt three types of validation. One is the process validation. When a uh, infection control nurse goes and looks into the uh, care bundle. Is she completely aware of what to look into? Is she doing the right way? Is the method correct? That is the first uh, validation. Once in a while, the infection control officer has to make sure that the method of data collection is correct. The second thing is the data validation, which is when the data comes in, you will understand, yes, the feedback forms are all filled by somebody there. It is not by the patients. You know by the certain tick that they are putting in, or the way that they are entering the data, you know there is some kind of a goof of goof up that is happening, or there is some kind of a problem with the data that is collecting. That is data validation. Once in a while, you take random samples and check if the data is corrected. Third thing is basically the formulae that you use. Is it in line with the uh, current practices? Are you adopting to the right formulae? Are you analyzing it appropriately? That is what we do: process data and the analysis validity. Here you have to do it regularly in response to queries and by going through data, using random sampling, detect and correct. Okay, so whatever data you're collecting, it's not just for the presentation to your quality inspectors from NAVH, but you need to make sure that the authenticated data is collected and presented to your teams, that you make good decisions based out of data. There's a mechanism for analysis of data which results in identifying opportunities for improvement. So all this data you are collecting, you need to understand when to take quality improvement projects. You understand that the trend is in an increasing trend. Your patient satisfaction is declining because the food is not appropriate. What do you do? Take it up as a quality improvement activity. So you need to look at the data critically and try and understand quality improvement projects that you can undertake out of that. Your discharge process is 11 hours. You want to try and reduce that. Take it up as a quality improvement project. So how you use this data, benchmark them and try and understand what to use as a quality improvement project. Okay. Now, what, what is a benchmark? How do you define a benchmark? That's again a science that you need to know. Benchmark can be defined in two, two ways. One is by published literature or rather three ways. One is by published literature. Like for example, a surgical site infection. You may have a published literature in an international journal of a hospital, a tertiary healthcare setup, a teaching hospital that has done a study and has understood that the surgical site infection is 3%. You could adopt that because they are in line with your way of functioning. That is one aspect. Second thing, you have your own national literature and guidelines already available. Your government may prescribe. This is your benchmark. LSCS versus normal, 25 versus 25 is to 75. So that's a prescribed benchmark. You could adopt that as your benchmark. The third way of adopting is what most of us do. And it's very, very important, not just to an arbitrary line of an upper control. This is what is my benchmark, 80%. Why? You don't know. Somebody has told you fix it as 80%. Don't do that. Look at the trend for two years. Look, take the average, take the standard deviation. If you set a standard deviation of plus, 
two standard deviation or minus two day standard deviation based on where you want to stand, then your data will be, your benchmark will be good. Why am I saying two standard deviation? Because if you set one standard deviation, your data, most of them will fall within the 68 percentage in a continuous, uh, if you have a sine curve, it will all fit into this 68 percentage. When you set two sigma, two, two standard deviation, it will fall within 95 percentage. So your data will try and help your, you will be able to understand the trend very well. If it is too close, then the trend, you will even understand smaller uh, issues which you don't want to look at it on a day-to-day -day basis. Whereas if you set a two sigma, then it is easier or a two standard deviation, then your benchmark will be good. This is out of my own practical experience I'm telling you. The improvements are implemented and evaluated. Whatever improvement you put down, measure, measure, measure. Understand where you stand and how you can make it better. So repeated PDCA cycles, which is what we are looking at. Plan, do, check and act. Keep on doing PDCA cycles. Measure and measure. Don't assume after this implementation, everything is all right. Then you are wrong. You have to measure and measure. Feedback about care and services communicated. Now all the feedback, all the indicators that you collect has to go back as rates, trends, opportunities for improvement to the stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? The doctors, the nurses, the units, the departments. Everybody needs to know. Should they know everything? Not necessary. At least those quality indicators that are relevant for them, they need to understand and know so that they can make improvements. How can you pass it on? Send it as circulars. Send it to them as individual letters in the form of bulletin, in the form of newsletter. You can put it in their notice boards. You can share it to them confidentially, whatever way you want. But people need to know the rates, trends and opportunities for improvement. Now coming to four, the organization uses appropriate quality improvement tools for activities. What are these tools that we are talking about? You need to understand that every aspect of quality, uh, without a quality improvement project, you are going to be a big zero. You need to identify opportunities for improvement. Understand which are the ones that you can take up as projects. So this whole thing has come up as one standard. It should have a definite purpose. What do you want to achieve? It should have a beginning and an end, not an ongoing thing. You keep on saying every year, this is my quality improvement project. Any hospital you go to, they say discharge process. Every year you go to, it's the discharge process. Never improves. So there has to be a beginning and an end. It has to be a time-bound activities within six months, within nine months, within one year. It is used to measure parameters under improvement. All the parameters that you want to measure, it should include. So it has to be a very smart quality improvement project. Every year, it is prescribed now that you should at least undertake two quality improvement projects. Good ones, not the same ones again and again. Organization uses appropriate analytical tools. What are these analytical tools? Your seven basic tools, your uh, root cause analysis, run charts, stratification, flow chart, Pareto, histogram. So please, quality professionals, understand these tools, the impact, the importance of these tools. It's not just a joke. How you apply, where you apply, when you apply, how you present, all this should be understood clearly because this is very important. Organization uses appropriate statistical tools, not just random samples here and there. How are you sampling? Is it a stratified one? Why have you adopted to a convenient sampling? adopt to Six Sigma methods or ANOVA or chi-square testing, it has to be statistically significant and not just percentages, 85 percentage say. How relevant is it? So you need to understand with the use of statistics, is it really relevant? The organization uses appropriate managerial tools. So we talked about analytical, we talked about statistical and now about managerial tools. What are these managerial tools? Apply lean. Waiting time, value added items, non-value added items, remove the non-value added, add value to your customer. Six Sigma, reduce your number of variations to 99.7. Now come down to plan to PDCA, look at tree diagrams, matrix diagrams, affinity. You can adopt umpteen number of managerial tools and bring about improvements in your systems. Now coming to clinical audit. Most of us are now very proficient with clinical audits, I think. Here it is extremely important. This is a one full standard. Clinical audits are, the, I always take it as a QIP, quality improvement project in the clinical area. That is what is a clinical audit. You need to have a standard, you need to have a benchmark, a criteria, a standard, which is clinical, and then try and improve this. What could be the topics, disease-based, cost-based, community-based, morbidity related? It can be retrospective, it can be prospective. At least one audit per department, per year should be conducted. Here in our organization, all our clinical interns do audits every year. 
So you need to use these clinical people to do the audit, motivate them, make sure that you make them understand it is not research. There is a standard, there is a guideline. All patients with previous MI have been administered aspirin unless contraindicated. This is a clinical audit. You try to understand where you stand, 70% compliance, educate, do proper history taking, make sure that your clientele is aware of the importance of taking aspirin, your compliance will improve. So that is a clinical audit by itself. So make sure that you have enough clinical audits conducted because this is the one that's going to bring in improvement in clinical care in your organization. You have to clearly define the parameters. What are the ones that you're auditing? It has to be standard based, defined parameters, encompass aspects of clinical and nursing. The nurses think clinical audit is only for doctors. No, clinical and nursing. Nursing, clinical pathways, standards, guidelines, make sure those are audited as well. Then you should have checklists, not a broad one like that without any pro forma. Have proper sample, proper data collection methodology. Prepare the report without documenting. It is of no use. You have to have a report and make sure you involve everybody. Is it only the clinician? No. Clinicians, administrators, nurses, core group, form a group. Make sure you want to improve the clinical outcomes of your stroke patients. Have the stroke protocol audited. You may take it as a quality improvement, your clinical audit. Make sure that they are auditing the door to thrombolysis tank. And that can bring in a lot of changes in the way you manage your patients. Understand this very, very clearly. Patient and staff anonymity to be maintained. When we go as assessors, we notice that often in all the audits, your hospital number, UHID, patient name, everything is noted down. That is not to be disclosed. It has to be anonymous. You can anonymize as X, Y, A, B, C. You want to track back, you can have a system of tracking also. But never ever use patient name for CPR audits or your mortality, anonymize wherever possible. Therefore, there will be openness and also avoid references in your conferences, public discussions, etc. And also make sure that even when you are doing staff awareness or staff audit, anonymity is maintained. This is very, very important. Clinical audits should be documented. There should be a closure. There should be a re-audit. So again, this is a PDCA cycle. You do one, understand that the compliance is only 80%. Next, you put in measures. After that, you re-audit. Now the compliance has gone up to 98 percentage. Excellent. So it has to be an audit cycle which is complete. There are many talks on clinical audits that are available in the Kavu website. Urge you to go through them carefully. Patient safety and quality improvement program are supported by the management. Now we are talking about the top management and their support. The most important aspect, which is a new element, is to create a culture of safety. Now everybody thinks, yes, we have a culture of safety. Only the quality and patient and the top management will have a culture of safety. All the others, you ask them, what is the international patient safety goal, national patient safety goal, the importance of that, people may, may not know. So you have to create that culture within the organization, starting from your doorman to your chairman, everybody. What is this culture we are talking about? It is an informed culture, sharing incidences. It's a reporting culture. Any small incidents to be reported. It's a learning culture. We learn out of the mistakes that we make. It is a just culture. We are fair and frank and not a punitive culture. It is a flexible culture, which means the protocols are not written in stone. We have to encourage collaboration among disciplines and departments so that everybody comes together and has a multidisciplinary approach. You have to measure the culture of safety in your organization at least once a year. You can use many validated tools available. It could be your Manchester Patient Safety Framework or Patient Safety Culture Assessment Tools. These are validated tools available. What are these tools talking about? What is this culture, first and foremost, that we are talking about? Excuse me. Yeah, what is this culture that we are talking about? The way we do things around here, that is what is culture. One person has an attitude, you know, that's an opinion. When everybody has the same attitude, then it is a culture. So it is the majority that we are talking about and the attitude of that majority, which is the culture in the organization. What are these parameters addressed by the safety, safety attitude questionnaire? Teamwork, climate, safety, job satisfaction, stress, working conditions. The four and five, these two, stress and working conditions are directly related to actually the patient safety issues. So here, if you use these validated tools, you'll be able to understand the stress in your organization, the working conditions, and you'll be able to actually link it to patient safety issues, which is what you're trying to assess. 
the leaders at all levels in the organization are aware of the intent now you have to get all your department level leaders involved in quality improvement and the exercise they need to understand the importance why this is run the applicability to their areas they need to be the champions in their areas that is why we are saying you need to have champions in every area your safety champions quality champions reporting to the heads of the department creating the culture in their own departments and eventually contributing to the patient safety and quality of the organization coming to departmental leaders getting involved in quality improvement that person is responsible for ensuring patient safety and quality improvement in their own organization you have to now list out department specific key performance indicators when you do that then i am not saying the quality manager has to sit and write down in lies in tune with the departments you have to discuss make sure that they start developing and that is all put together they start monitoring they start measuring they start making improvement moment that comes in the accountability the ownership comes into picture that is one great way of getting the departmental leaders involved in this exercise management makes available resources for patient safety and quality improvement what are the resources men material machine money milieu method measurement all that to implement you need to have resources whether you have adequate number of people to support you statistician tools computers other resources meeting areas training material conferences all that is extremely important to enhance your understanding and the understanding of patient safety and quality in your organization there should be an annual budget the organization has to year by budget based on previous year spending uh, and year mark after 6 months you have to review whether that is sufficient you have to enhance it make sure that you have a good quality budget available it's often the salary of the quality manager and some aspects of small small expenses here and there but make sure you have a comprehensive budget why should you have the budget so that you have the freedom and to spend on issues that are priority for patient safety and quality management identifies organizational performance improvement targets now this is important making sure that the benchmarks are set targets are set this is not the financial target i must make 100 crores no targets on where you want to stand with your hand hygiene modify the targets at least annually which is the benchmarks that we talked about earlier to two standard deviation is it better to bring it down bring it to three standard deviation all that you'll have to look at it very carefully share the targets get feedback from them and make sure you have a culture created in the organization management uses feedback obtained from the workforce to improve the patient safety and quality improvement exercise which means you have to now engage with your staff to understand if there are issues you have to take feedback from them on patient safety and quality and their inputs on where they think systems and processes could be improved and that inputs should be incorporated and made sure that you have a department or an organization wide program which is accepted by your staff the management can obtain feedback once a year staff should also be able to raise concern whenever they occur now they are going to be doing lots of surveys patient safety culture you have to start about awareness of staff you have to do this good more and more you do the better your staff become aware of the issues incidents now coming to seven incidents are collect, collected analyzed to ensure and continual quality improvement what are these incidents you have to have a method of reporting first and foremost identify whether it's an incident at all how to report once it is reported how it is reviewed and what are the actions that are taken how are you putting that as a protocol once the protocol modification is made how is it reported back to the teams factual reporting and learning principle of just culture nobody is penalized it is just you i need to understand exactly what happens all incidents without going into severity or whether harm can cause should also be captured how they are reported in a standardized format reporting system please understand should be very simple here in my organization is only incident reporting after that we look at it whether it is near miss adverse sentinel all that the moment you start telling people this is sentinel this is advance this is near miss then they are confused whether this is this or that anyway it is should be simple reporting not a very complex form that one needs to fill it has to be very clearly worded it has to be confidential and it has to improve on process improvement not like i don't have a car park as an incident but you need to make sure it improves the process we all know the definition of sentinel events i am not going to get into this in detail whenever there is a sentinel event you have to identify those and make sure uh, is it related to system or process understand where the problems are happening and understand 
the list, first and foremost, you have to list out all the sentinel events, wrong patient operated, wrong site, wrong surgery performed, wrong procedure, retained objects, all that has to be clearly defined. These are the sentinel events. So that all staff are aware that these are the sentinel events and they have to report definitely without making any mistakes. Organization has established process for analyzing of incidents. This is very important. Reporting has happened. How do you analyze this? Root cause, you have to understand. Often, I will take next five minutes. Often, what we do is we go by hearsay. The most important thing for a quality team to look, look at is to have the gemba walk, understand from all perspective how this incident happened. Put it, document it like a FIR. Put it down clearly at this time, this time, 624, 625. Put it down clearly so that you have the entire sequence from all the stakeholders. Then sit down and do a root cause analysis with the multidisciplinary team. You could do 5Y, uh, asking why, why, why questions. You could use many tools to try and understand, brainstorm, understand the problems. And any sentinel events, understand it has to be looked into within 24 hours. You have to corrective action has to be taken immediately. Address immediate care and support those needs, those who require to be supported. Don't wait for the analysis at all. You have reported, your job doesn't end there. Make sure that the issue is addressed immediately. After that, within 24 hours, you have to start the analysis. And within seven days, it has to be completed. Your entire analysis has to be completed. It is not in one meeting. And please note that the safety committee should be responsible for analysis of these incidents. Who is responsible? It is the broader safety committee which is responsible for the analysis of these incidents. How are you taking the corrective and preventive actions based on these analysis? Take the kappa, continuously improve. The whole idea is to prevent any recurrence in the system. It could be in from one ICU, it cannot happen in other areas also. Make sure that the proper systems are put in place so that you don't have recurrence. Communicate the findings to all those who are concerned. Don't shy away from communicating. You don't have to communicate the entire incident. You can put it in a nice narrative and try and make sure that the new protocol is made uh, communicated to all the staff. Your own documentation based on what you have found. You may have changed some policies and protocols. Immediately change them in your manuals and make sure that the staff are aware of it. This is another new objective element. The organization incorporates risk identified in the analysis of incidents into the risk management system. So we are keeping on talking about risk, risk, risk. Here, any new risk identified, it has to go back into your organizational risk register. You need to have a risk management manual where you are putting down all the risk identified, the controls, the mitigation measures, and whatever your residual risk are. So this risk register, whenever you identify something new, add it to the risk management system, put controls there. Any unidentified risk revealed in incident analysis should be subjected to risk management. Identify and the organization shall have a process for informing various stakeholders in case of near miss adverse events at the event. We talked about it earlier. How are you going to discuss this? How are you going to pass this on to the department, to the patient, to the relatives? How do you initiate CAPA? All this should be very clearly defined and followed appropriately. Who should be involved in this? Should all be documented and followed. Now, apart from all these that we talked, there are other areas where your quality team and the patient safety team has to be very, very much available and aware of. All your committees, we are part of many, many committees. So how to run committees, how to make sure that they are minuted, documented. Now, another important aspect is the document control, the ISO way of document control, control documents. Whenever new protocols are made, how are you going to be monitoring that? How are you going to issue that? How are you going to make sure that everybody knows the new protocol? Risk management is another area where quality and safety professionals will have to completely be aware of and get involved in. How are you monitoring the quality of your outsource services is often the job of quality managers. Sometimes the HR does it. Training of all the staff, the training needs assessment, again, can be the job of the quality teams. Statutory compliances, definitely quality and patient safety groups have a large area of concern in statutory. Many reports like air quality, water quality, compressed air, endotoxin levels, all those also you may need to be involved in. Critical alerts, whether the labs are raising that, is it entered in the register, is there an audit conducted, that appropriate clinical intervention has taken, that is something as an audit that you may have to get involved in. There are three major areas where material vigilance program, hemovigilance, pharmacovigilance, those are three main areas that the quality teams and safety professionals will have to be involved in. Coming to chart documentation, the real-time audits, the medical 
medical records review, the deficiency check, all your indicators you could derive out of this and you may have to be very actively involved and be aware of these aspects. Developing new templates, checklists, formats, making sure that they are controlled documents, making sure that they are appropriate and you are not over capturing or under capturing is something that the quality professionals should have to be completely aware of. And again, coordination between departments. If you don't have that, one department will follow one format, another will have a separate SOP for that. So standardization, coordination, making sure that they are simplified is another major area of concern for the quality managers. So quality and patient safety and other professionals, it's not an easy job at all. It's a thankless job, I should say. It is uh, something that one has to take up with a lot of passion and continuously learn and learn and learn as there are newer things that we may need to learn and pass on to our hospitals and our uh, doctors, nurses, everybody, so that we are aligned to patient safety and quality improvement in our organizations. Thank you very much for the patient listening. I have shot, I have gone over time, I knew I would do that because it's a very, very huge area that I had to address. Thanks for your patient listening. And if there are any questions, I'm very, very happy to address. I think I addressed this. Uh, Kalgi Shah has put up what are the roles and responsibilities of patient safety officer and clinical safety officer. Patient safety officer is a broad one where it could, it's the overall area of safety. Clinical safety is very specific to clinical aspects, which is the patients, you know, the WHO patient safety or the national patient safety goals, anything that is very, very pertinent to patient safety. But I think the terminology, what they've used as patient safety and clinical safety is a little confusing. I suppose you should take it as safety and clinical safety. That's what I would say. Can we show RPN under FMEA? Definitely. FMEA calculation involves RPN, risk prioritization, and that is a Tool, FMEA is a tool and that is based out of the RPN. Director of the institute who is clinician can become, definitely can become a patient safety officer. Involvement from the top is what is most important. Can you share facility inspection checklist format? I'm unable to share now, but I'm more than happy to share some formats through the WhatsApp group. Any additional qualification and experience required for clinical safety officer or nursing course with HIC practical knowledge is enough. Not necessary, not enough at all. HIC is only one component of clinical safety. Clinical safety officer has to be thorough with risk management. Definitely about all the other patient safety related aspects like, uh, you know, analyzing incidents, uh, the WHO patient safety goals, uh, handing over, taking. So HIC aspect is only one component. So they have to lo know the entire gamut of patient safety. So I would urge uh, the person who's asking this question to have a thorough knowledge get into complete aspects of patient safety, importance of communication in patient safety, importance of identifying the right patient, checklist, uh, safe birth checklist, surgical safety checklist, all those are extremely important. Uh, what should be the agenda of the monthly safety committee meeting? Uh, your key safety indicators, your, in, your facility inspection rounds, your internal inspection rounds, your incidents on safety aspects, all those could become agenda for your uh, safety committee. You could even discuss some indicators, you know, you can define this month I'm going to discuss five safety indicators, next month another five. That is another way of doing. Otherwise, your meetings may go on for a longer time. Kindly differentiate between hospital safety, patient safety and clinical safety. Yes, the hospital safety officer and patient safety officer are one and the same. Clinical safety officer is a clinical person, a doctor or a nurse looking into complete patient safety. I hope I'm clear on that. Is there any criteria to go for NABH full accreditation uh, from entry level? Yes, you have to comply with all the norms. 651 objective elements. Entry level, you may have looked into only 169 if you are a hospital which is more than 50 beds. Now you have to look at 651 objective elements. Please explain about the current IPSG. IPSG, International Patient Safety Goals, is it's actually a WHO patient safety goals. If you Google international patient safety goals, you will definitely get everything. But let me tell you, it is identifying the right patient, uh, clinical handovers, patient safety, pressure source, acquired infections. Now, all those are part of the international patient safety goals. Any suggestion to report incident report because staff feel they'll be punished. Anonymous reporting. Encourage anonymous reporting. I don't think anybody should feel threatened. Also look at the culture in your organization. Whether you have a just culture, a punitive culture, you need to look at it. 
if staff are feeling that they'll be fun punished then there's something wrong you have to definitely look at it ours is a single specialty neuro hospital now we are in entry level we are planning to implement nabh can we proceed uh, yes you have to at least implement do an internal audit make sure you have complied with all the 600 now at the moment you don't have to comply with all 651 all the core and commitment level objective elements that is about 500 and odd 561 if i am right comply with that and then you can apply don't apply just like that because now there is no pre assessment and you will end up having lot of non compliances in the final assessment better to do an internal audit yourself try and understand where you stand if you have more than 70 percentage compliance go ahead and apply please define kra it is the key responsibility areas each area will have certain responsibilities like the key performance indicators you have to also define the key responsibility for each area and monitor whether those are being adhered to um lots of questions all 32 quality indicators are to be implemented for pre assessment it is how many months data now it is your option whether you want to go for pre assessment or you can directly go for final assessment it is no longer mandatory yes you need to have at least 3 to 6 months data available before you apply for assessment how many quality managers there is no number on the number of quality managers my hospital we have one quality manager one safety officer one audit officer and one nurse manager four of us taking care of this entire 3000 bedded hospital including safety and patient safety is it mandatory to take a quality round on a daily basis not mandatory it is up to you to define depending on the size of your hospital uh, and the areas that you want to cover how should be the format of the internal checklist define put down all the audit points that you want to check you want to go into medical gas area put down everything whether the pressure checks are done whether they are connected color coding everything put down point by point yes no and if there is a partial compliance that is a easy way of tracking and have one small area for writing comments also how to calculate the number of opportunities for medication errors i explain this it is extremely difficult i think there is a small mistake in that i'll come back on that Uh, i don't think it is opportunities of medication errors that one can capture how to calculate adherence to safety precaution uh, what are the points needed to check in lab and radiology yes all the safety requirements should be put down in the manual whether it is chemical safety use of appropriate ppe spillages all that needs to be and use of apron glove mask all that to be put down for each area as a performer and do it in a radiology you could look at the usage of tld led aprons whether they are hung appropriately whether the safety signage is there whether the door is closed appropriately all those could become checkpoints we have the outsource laboratory is it necessary to capture other indicators also go ahead and capture because based on the outsourced uh, laboratory only you are pro uh, providing clinical care so it is good to capture but if your lab is not going to be accredited it's not mandatory but it's good to capture them explain about i think i have explained apache score what is the intent of the indicator return of cut strips see what happens is often with the cut strips your entire system gets corrupted so they go in and then the batch numbers and the expiry dates are often not written in that uh, covers and that uh, often ends up with patients without any expiry date so it is again a patient safety issue you don't know whether the medication has expired or not so that is why we have put down that as a quality indicator explain nurse patient ratio in detail i would urge you to join this hr program that we are going to be conducting on april 24 the mrs uh, miss grace uh, ajitha is going to be explaining on equity based nursing how to calculate okay how to actually derive at equity based nursing load at the moment it is one is to one for ventilated patients one is to up to one is to three for non ventilated one is to six for uh, ward patients that's how what you will calculate up to one is to eight or 10 depending on the type of workload for nurses is it necessary to capture a prom and prem yes you have to initiate prom is patient reported outcome and prem is patient reported experience it is good to capture those it is mandatory now any standards about number of quality no none how many qips to be done yearly the more the better can the clinical audits be considered as quality improvement projects yes it can be but better to have process related non clinical ones as quality improvement projects because they will have a larger improvement measure on patient's experience so 
take quality improvement projects as non clinical process project improvement and use the clinical audits for improvement of the clinical processes how to calculate smr i think i explained that uh, sure so can we share some checklists for clinical audits there are no checklists for clinical audits it is dependent on the topic the standard the guideline that you are adopting and what you want to measure and put as a criteria so if you really want i can share couple of clinical audits that are very easy to start with then you can uh, develop based on that can you send some checklist for daily quality rounds again uh, as quality professionals i think we should know in depth how to prepare but yes as a starting point i think i will share some of the checklists in the whatsapp group uh, re exploration any documented definition yes there are many standard definitions available what is the timeline to store the documents in the department again some are statutory like narcotics and all that i think it is 3 years uh, others you can develop your own internal uh, uh, you know document retention policy and keep them how many clinical audit one per department is mandatory kindly suggest some clinical audits for oncology your own adherence of your patients to the oncology protocols can be one good clinical audit that uh, you can or you know the uh, kind of uh, um, the number of punctures that you are making the uh, paid, uh, the looking at the uh, issues of uh, uh, what can you say yeah your safety practices in uh, your mixing of chemo drugs the awareness of people and the complaints of the patients uh, on follow ups and all that can become good clinical audit topics for oncology um do we need to have separate committee one hospital safety one not necessary it's a broad committee that we are talking about both aspects yes you can discuss all clinical safety measures include patient safety then why this differentiation uh yes for big hospitals of course there is a need for a differentiation because you want to now focus on patient safety and you want to include the clinical teams into patient safety that is why there is a differentiation between broad safety and patient safety or rather clinical safety i think it's a very good move kindly share okay related checklist do we need to have yes one hospital safety one patient safety no it's a broad committee where you can discuss both my hospital got pre entry 2 years ago we want to apply for full yes at least 3 to 6 months um okay yeah minakshi what i would suggest is we will note down all these questions let me try and answer them okay through emails probably give some examples of quality improvement projects there are lots you can do improvement of your food supply your discharge process your patient satisfaction improvement looking at the waiting time and making improvements in waiting time all those are very good quality improvement projects including your own usage of electricity going green using recyclable materials all that can become good indicator a good quality improvement projects how useful is internal benchmarking for hais uh, i wouldn't uh, really agree upon internal benchmarking for hospital acquired infections because if your infection rates are higher uh, you are going to benchmark against your averages It, uh, there is lot of literature now available for comparison purpose so at least for hospital acquired infections where you have published literature benchmarks national international state wise district wise benchmarks available it is good to adopt that otherwise you could end up in a danger point of feeling that you are doing well so it is best to benchmark on whatever is available against that um yeah all right many questions on sharing of checklists audits all that which i will do okay risk register and hira if you want to know i would urge you to join the program there are over 100 participants from eight countries who are doing this program in certified in health care risk management i will ask minakshi to share on that it will give you a thorough understanding of how to do hazard identification risk assessment risk tools how to apply fmea 
how to do the risk register everything uh, can the kpi be taken as a qip yes if there's an increasing or a decreasing trend in a key performance indicator you can definitely take that as a qip for example if your hand hygiene rates are very high you can you do it as a qip definitely okay all right i think the others are almost similar sharing of lot of documents that people are asking for and for this wonderful opportunity i must say it's been a great experience for me to to go through this in depth but i'm sorry i have taken more time um over to you minakshi and joseph sir. yeah i think uh, going with the sheer number of uh, questions that were asked it shows how uh, involved and enthused uh, the participants were so i think uh, dr alu joseph as usual uh, took to the entire panelists and thing and then there was not a moment of dullness over that very very interesting even for me it was like it was more like a rehash of those quality initiatives that we used to do thank you ma'am so much hope to see you again soon and i wish the participants would attend many more such uh, programs and and on on webinars and zoom meetings thank you so much thanks me nachi thank you sir thank you ma'am and thank you sir ma'am as usual the chat box is flooded with too many uh, nice feedbacks yeah. and i thank all the participants for your wonderful participation thank you